are we operating through a lens of oppression when we are parenting our children? Or do we want to parent through a lens of liberation and say, actually, I'm going to normalize what it feels like to feel free and what it feels like to be empowered to use your voice. You're listening to the Mindful Mama podcast, episode number 265. Today, we're talking about transforming your authoritarian roots with Leslie Ariola Hillenbrand. Welcome to the Mindful Mama podcast, now with over a million downloads. Here, it's about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. At Mindful Mama, we know that you cannot give what you do not have. And when you've calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm your host, Hunter Clark Fields, Mindful Mama Mentor. I help smart, thoughtful parents stay calm so they can have strong, connected relationships with their children. I've been practicing mindfulness for over 20 years. I'm the creator of Mindful Parenting, and I'm the author of Raising Good Humans, a mindful guide to breaking the cycle of reactive parenting and raising kind, confident kids. Hey, welcome back, my friend. I am I'm glad you're here. Glad to be connecting with you today. If you're new, welcome. So happy to have you here. Hope you're hanging in there in this crazy pandemic world if you're listening in real time. It is so cold here in Delaware. My little finger's freezing off. And I, at one point earlier this winter, I was really wishing for snow and now I'm kind of regretting it. No, thank you, universe. I would really like some spring now. Yes, yes, yes. So I hope you are hanging in there. In just a moment, I'm going to be sitting down with Leslie Ariola Hillenbrand, who is a first-generation non-Black Chicana. She is a mother to three biracial children and a certified parent coach with over 13 years of experience. And she has a vision rooted in children's rights, social and racial justice, nonviolence and reparenting, intergenerational and ancestral healing, cultural sustenance, and decolonization of oppressive practices in our families towards liberation. Check that out, right? I'm so excited to dive into this conversation, you know, because the truth is our parenting styles are really strongly influenced by both how we were parented and our current societal norms, right? But for a lot of us, we come, you know, there's there's all these wonderful great roots that we want to take from our own parenting and our own culture, but some of those things don't feel right. What if we were in a culture that, you know, wasn't so great with children and we want children to deserve more? So in this conversation, I talked to Leslie about her experience growing up in an authoritarian culture and how she has looked to the history of her ancestry to change the future. So cool. So I want you to listen for three important takeaways, how we all bring different cultural parenting habits and patterns to the table, how an essential step for liberation for you and your kids is re-mothering or re-parenting yourself. And then the final takeaway I really want you to listen for, and this is such a big piece of this conversation, is how oppression begins at home. And are we teaching our kids to use their voices? I was thinking about this last night as our kids were negotiating something and my husband wasn't so happy about it. And I was like, well, they are learning to negotiate for their needs, right? And that's actually something I want. So I just wanted to bring that perspective in. So I can't wait for you to be part of this conversation. I know you're going to want to listen to the end to get all the wonderful good stuff in it. And many of you, before we dive in, many of you have asked about taking all this work we do in the podcast deeper with the Mindful Parenting membership. So I thought I would share with you some recent member wins. So this is just from last week. And Kelly has said that her meditations are really helping with her stressful week. Shannon has been continuing to do her meditation and yoga, and she is making progress on some of the uh, communication skills that we are working on and releasing the need to give a solution and make things just so, right? And I want to give a shout out to Allie, who reported to me that she was super frustrated with her five-year-old, and instead of acting on it, she said, I need to take take care of my anger. And she went to a separate 
separate room and she did some child's pose and this is so sweet her two-year-old a couple minutes later her two-year-old came into the room and said did you take care of your anger oh my gosh that is so awesome i love that so so much if you want to learn more about the membership and to get the whole mindful parenting roadmap for free head to mindfulmamamentor.com slash stop yelling that's mindfulmamamentor.com slash stop yelling. And if you are listening on device, well, there's a place where you can click for show notes and it'll show the show notes and there you can find that link right there for mindfulmamamentor.com slash stop yelling and get it right now. So go for it. Get the free mindful parenting roadmap and my top two best tools to stop yelling and you won't regret it. It will be great. All right. So I think that's all I need to share with you. I am so excited about this conversation. Join me at the table as I talk to Leslie Ariola Hillenbrand. All right, Leslie, thank you so much for coming on the Mindful Mama podcast. Thank you so much, Hunter, for having me. I'm so happy to be here. I'm happy to talk to you. And um, there's so there's so many things that we I, I want to talk to you about because we have we have a lot of like amazing overlap that I'm super excited about, but. Um, first just tell us what is, what is Latin, you know, you, you're the founder of like one of the founders of Latinx parenting. So like, tell me what that is. I had, I like Google, I did a little Wikipedia search and now I know like the whole background of the, the word, but tell me a little bit more about it. <laughs> yeah. So Latinx parenting was really born out of, um, for me, it was a lack of representation in the parenting world. And so I would, you know, devour, Dan Siegel's books, Tina Payne Bryson's books. I would devour, um, you know, Shafali Sabari. And at the same time, there was this part that I didn't feel seen in some of these books about. Um, and so I started working with Latinx fam families and Latinx, the term itself, um, it's Latino Latina, which I think most people would probably know, you know, what that means, just having lineage from Latin America. Um, but the Latinx is an attempt to be inclusive of people who don't adhere to the gender binary. Um, and so, you know, I really, I've actually gotten a lot of pushback about the Latinx for, for whatever reason, like people are not, you know, feeling like that is part of the language and it's not, but we're adapting. Um, and so I'm really excited to just, you know, receive the, the um, gratitude from people who are like, thank you for seeing us, those people who are not conforming to the gender binary. Um, and so Latinx parenting is really an attempt to include everybody. Um, and also, you know, it's important for me to state that the term Latinx does not mean that we are a monolithic culture. I think that obviously there are so many differences throughout all of Latin America and the way that all families operate um, with their children, but there are commonalities, you know, and there are things that can be addressed that have found resonance, I think, from people from Mexico, from people from Guatemala, from people from Ecuador. And so Latinx parenting is, is an attempt to address um, the fact that we do have shared commonalities and we do have shared experiences as children having grown up in Latinx culture. And so Latinx parenting was born out of, you know, me really trying to fill a need that I really wanted filled for me when I was a, a young parent um, nine years ago. So that's kind of how it started. And there's so much more to it, but um, yeah, you know, Yay. it's Latinx parenting. Yay, cool. Um, yeah, so now, now we got the basics down. And, and I'm interested in what, like, what you see as the commonalities, but I'm also really curious about like, so you were, you were feeling like you, you know, you're in this kind of like peaceful parenting world, right? Like nonviolent parenting, you know, all that. And, and you're not feeling represented. So I'm curious about like, you know, I'm curious about, I'm curious about your own upbringing and, you know, where that was the disconnect maybe between that and then this nonviolent parenting world that you were, you know, interested in and looking at and wanting that representation in. Yeah. And I think this has come up also with the parents that I work with since then. There's, um, you know, a very unique aspect to being raised by a Latina mother, but especially by an immigrant mother. 
Um, my parents were born in Mexico. And so my mom came here when she was very young. She was 14 years old, started working right away. And that's a very common experience, actually, for a lot of children of immigrants who had parents who came to the United States very young. Um, and so the stressors that impacted my mom were very different than the stressors that impacted your mom, the stressors that impacted maybe like Dan Siegel, Tina Payne. I don't know their parents, but sure. you know, they, they were very Dan different. wouldn't talk to me about his parents, by the way. Oh, interesting. You can listen back <laughs> to the episode. The first, I talked to Dan Siegel twice. And in the first episode, I asked him about how he was parented and he, he got, he was like, it was like, there's a moment of tension. Like he didn't want to talk about that. So that it's, is mysterious. It's mysterious, right? <laughs> I'm going to maybe do some poking around and see if I'm <laughs> you know, ask that same question. Um, yeah, but I think, you know, having had that experience of being mothered and being fathered by immigrants, like there were systemic institutional and cultural influences that were present in their parenting that, you know, having gone to a majority Caucasian high school um, here where I live in Santa Ana, I quickly realized that that was not the case for, for some of my white peers. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was kind of at this borderline, um, you know, where I was straddling these two cultures, where I was very much um, entrenched in my mom's family and, you know, Mexican culture and going to fiestas and seeing the way that, you know, my tias and my tios, my aunts and uncles parented their children. And then going to like my white friends' homes and being like, whoa, this is really different. You know, like you actually get listened to sometimes, you know, like you don't get threatened. <laughs> you don't get. And so for me, you know, all my cousins and I have very shared experiences of respect. You know, you, you had to obey and that was a way that you demonstrated respect. You had to be very willing to be a part of the family. And this is a value called familismo in Latinx families where, you know, you want the family to stay together. And it's actually a really beautiful aspect of Latinx culture is that we are a collectivist culture. And so I think for some of us who are child, children of immigrants, we're in this place where we want to be individualistic because that's the culture that we're living in. We want to independentize. We want to make sure that we have autonomy. And at the same time, we want to honor our cultural roots of being collectivist, of being more community-based. Um, and so, you know, Latinx parenting kind of explores that a lot in our parenting classes, um, honors our autonomy, and then also honors the fact that our parents struggled. You know, they really struggled to assimilate, they struggled to acculturate, um, and they may not have had as much access to some of the resources that other families had. So, um, you know, my hope is that we are growing in compassion for our experience. And in doing so, we're growing in, in compassion for our parents and our children. That's beautiful. You know, and, and kind of what I'm hearing is that like, like there were, there are these pieces that are, are really beautiful that you want to keep like this collectivist family, family, small family. <laughs> and, uh, and that's really beautiful because that's a lot more supportive in a lot of ways than, um, then, you know, the whole like push to be always like super independent is like exhausting and it's not natural for human beings to be completely independent. Does it, does it make a lot of sense for us to be in these like nuclear families, um, yeah. and doing it all on our own. And so there's like these beautiful, you know, so you're like seeing these beautiful roots of these incredibly positive pieces, but then also like these other pieces that you're not like super crazy about passing on, yeah. I bet too, you know, and, and there's, there's like a, uh, you, you're straddling these two cultures. Yeah. I think, you know, I had therapists that would say like, just, just set the boundary, you know, just set the boundary with your mom, because we have this like idea in Western psychology about like enmeshment, you know, enmeshment is bad. And, and it's more nuanced than that. You know, there have been people that have come into my classes that have said like, I, I can't set that boundary with my parents. Like it's just not accepted because the values um, are this feminism, it is this respect. Um, and if you try to set a boundary, sometimes that is seen as disrespectful, right? So if you're like, hey, that doesn't feel good to me, which a lot of us don't even feel empowered to say sometimes because we weren't given that freedom as children. Um, if we were to now say that to our parents, that is seen as almost a rejection of family values. Um, and so it's not just Latinx culture. I think a lot of other, um, you know, people and families from cultures actually that have been colonized. I've, I've seen similarities in 
um, you know, African American and Black uh, families. I've seen similarities in Asian families. And so um, I really kind of started to like unpack why this was, right? Like this, if we are a collectivist culture, if children are wanted to be a part of the family so bad, then why are children in our families treated so poorly sometimes, hmm. you know? And so as I kind of started to dig deeper and understand the layers and the historical narratives around Latinx families, like what drove my mom to migrate at 14 years old? You know, what is the, what is the history? What is my lineage um, being impacted by intergenerationally and ancestrally that I can now acknowledge and I can now try to heal in myself so that I can heal it in my children as well. Um, and so there's all these layers around, you know, oppression and like all of these experiences I think that we've had as a people um, that don't get acknowledged sometimes in the parenting world. You know, it's more of a, this is what you do. And this is, um, you know, take your self care time. And so I feel like having worked with Latinx populations for as long as I have, like the layers just keep getting deeper. Hmm. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and and you you and I can relate enormously over that whole like generational patterns. Just kind of seeing those that healing that is needed to do right, like that there are these these wounds that happen, and there's this healing that we can do, and we, we can do this some transformation for our children. You know, we can do a little heavy lifting as far as healing some of that stuff, so that our, our children don't necessarily have to do that, which yeah. I love. Stay tuned for more Mindful Mama podcasts right after this break. Do you like all your snacks? I personally get tired of some of mine. Some healthy snacks don't satisfy your cravings. And that's why I'm so happy that this episode is sponsored by Monk Pack, who makes snacks that taste so yummy, like your favorite sugary treats, but with just one gram of sugar or less. They're great for anyone following a keto lifestyle and the perfect snack for anyone who's trying to eat better or cut back on sugar and carbs without sacrificing taste. My favorite, they have this Monk Pack Keto Nut and Seed Bar and they have a caramel sea salt one. Oh my yum, it is so yummy and so satisfying and is good for you. Monk Pack Keto Nut and Seed Bars have the perfect balance. I can attest to this, of sweet and salty, crunch from whole nuts and seeds, but they still manage to be soft and chewy too. They come in delicious flavors like caramel sea salt, sea salt dark chocolate, and peanut butter dark chocolate. They're perfect for a quick snack to satisfy your sweet tooth without any guilt. Enjoy Monk Pack Keto Nut and Seed Bars as a quick breakfast while running errands or after a workout. I'm going to be grabbing one on my way out today because I'm going to get my haircut and then meeting a friend for a walk and that is going to be the perfect snack. I'm going to be loving my Monk Pack Bar. And in addition to being keto friendly, they are gluten-free, plant-based, and non-GMO with no soy, trans fat, sugar alcohols, or artificial flavors. They taste incredible and you can't beat the low sugar nutrition or taste they provide. And you can shop online, not another trip to the store, just get it delivered right to your door. So try it for yourself and you'll see. And we'll have a special deal for our listeners. Get 20% off your first purchase of any Monk Pack product by visiting monkpack.com and entering our code HUNTER at checkout. And Monk Pack is so confident in their product, it's backed with 100% satisfaction guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll exchange the product or refund your money, whatever you prefer. To get started, just go to monkpack.com, that's M-U-N-K-P-A-C-K.com and select any product, then enter the code HUNTER at checkout and save 20% off your purchase. And wherever you're listening to the podcast, there are show notes that you can click on right on the device you're listening to right now. So if you check it out right now on mine, I can scroll down and see the notes for this podcast, and you'll see a bunch of links, including the one for this Monk Pack, M-U-N-K-P-A-C-K.com link, and you can get your 20% off right now. Monk Pack, delicious, nutritious food you can count on. We thank them for sponsoring the Mindful Mama podcast. 
we are expected sometimes like, oh my gosh, now that I know that this pattern exists, now that I know mm-hmm. that I have this intergenerational um, you know, trauma factor, and now that I'm reconnecting to my body, I have found that in a lot of the groups that I do, people feel a lot of pressure, like, oh my gosh, I have to heal this. You know, I have to make sure that I do it differently mm-hmm. so that I don't mess up my kids. You know, I don't mm-hmm. want to mess up my kids. Um, and so I have to stop the group sometimes and say, let's just acknowledge the fact that that's a really heavy burden on our shoulders to feel like we have to heal our entire lineage. I don't want anyone to ever feel that pressure because pressure creates stress sometimes and stress mm-hmm. creates the opposite of what we want to create in our families. Yeah. So, you know, I really invite people to be very gentle with themselves and to say, I'm going to do what is in my capacity to do, um, you know, day to day, moment to moment. And some days are going, uh, uh, the weight of the world is going to be on my shoulders. And on those days, it's going to be okay to rest and really reclaim that rest um, and not feel like I have to heal, you know, all of the seven generations before me and then all seven generations in front of me um, because we're human you know, we're human and, and this experience should be enjoyed as much as possible too. Yes. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, there's a, a beautiful song actually, uh, by an art, a, f- a folk artist that I really like, uh, Dar Williams. She has a song called the weight of the world. Have you ever heard it? No, I haven't. Oh, you have to look at, I, I, up, I put it in actually the mindful parenting membership because it's like, Oh, like, let's remember, you know, that, the weight of the world is not yours to carry, right? Like, yeah, you can, you can do what you can do. Um, so did you, you, did you grow up, you, was it you and your mom? Did you grow up with a single mom? I did after I was eight and a half years old, I was with a single mom. My parents split up when I was eight and a half and, um, it was very tumultuous. Um, it added other layers of stress for her that I didn't really understand. Um, you know, for a long time, I, I really, placed a lot of blame, I think, on her about the way that she was unable to show up for me emotionally. Um, you know, since then, we've been really able to heal our relationship. I'm in my mid-30s now, and so it's it's taken a long time. Um, but there were things that impacted her parenting that, as a mother now, I'm like, oh... <laughs> Yeah, this is hard, actually. <laughs> and so my daughter is nine, which is about the age that uh, my parents went through their separation. And so thinking about my mom in the context of having a nine-year-old, having a brand new baby, because my sister and I are nine years apart. And so she and my dad split up when my sister was a really little baby. Um, and so just thinking about like all of that stress, you know, all of the the, the pressure to now be um, the sole income earner for this new family of three, you know, downsizing from a house into like a tiny little two bedroom apartment, having to work two jobs. Like there were so many things that impacted her that it took a long time for me to say, wow, like, you know, this person who migrated, this woman who migrated here at 14 years old after her father died um, and started working right away. Like that is a chunk of your childhood that was lost. How could you have been expected to mother in these ways that we encourage, right? Like you and I will encourage parents to mother in really present ways and really listen and validate when you did not get that experience whatsoever. I mean, she was one of 12 children and she was the sixth child and she was like right at that, at that middle point. Um, And so, you know, the remothering of myself has been really crucial for my own healing. Um, And I think in doing so, it's provided a model for her and given Mm -hmm. her permission to to remother herself, you know, and we don't use this language really together, but there are things that she will say that feel very self-sacrificing. And I'll ask her, like, does that feel good to you? You know, do you really actually want to do that? Um, And so I'm seeing her like set boundaries with family members now too. And it's really cool to watch um, just like her her remothering process. but that can be sometimes for us a heavy burden too, right? Like I have done a lot of work around not feeling burdened by caring for my mom in that way. Mm -hmm. But for some of us who were parentified, um, meaning we were given that responsibility of a parent from a very, very young age Mm -hmm. um, and meeting the need of our parents, that can be really triggering, right? Like that can be really activating for us to still be trying to meet the needs of our parents. And I find that a lot. um, And I find that it's very common in Latinx families um, because we are so collectivist, right? And we're we're just kind of always together. 
And so in the work that I do, I'm, I'm wanting to encourage people like, you know, it's, it's okay to not feel like you have to um, be your parent's parent. Yes. Yes, this is true for oh, sure. So, oh. so where do you, what do you see as, um, you know, what do you see as, you know, there are these like incredibly positive seeds and there are these negative seeds. What are the things that you were wanting to transform that you were like, I don't, I don't want to pass this on. Yeah. So the last couple of years, I've really started thinking about um, parenting strategies, specifically in Latinx homes. And again, this is not like a monolithic thing. This is a commonality and that we have this idea of authoritarian practices as the only way to guide children. And so I call that chancla culture. Um, and the chancla means a, like literally it means a sandal or a flip-flop. Um, and so there's, if you Google chancla, Google chancla culture or just chancla, C-H-A-N-C-L-A, um, you'll find memes, you'll find like all kinds of glorification of la chancla, right? And people will say, like they'll come into uh, my social media and say like, chancla culture is the only reason that I turned out great. You know, like if I hadn't been guided with this heavy hand um, and hit, then hit I would have- sandal? Is that why it's a sandal? Well, that's like the emblem. That's the okay. emblem. But to me, honestly, chancla. I got the wooden spoon, but you know, maybe you had this yeah, sandal, it, right? <laughs> still, in, still within that realm of chancla culture. So okay. I consider it just, you know, any form of violence, any form of authoritarianism over children. Um, it's childism, you know, it's adult supremacy over children. And so it yeah. doesn't just have to be this physical sandal. It could be a wooden spoon. It could be a hanger. It could be um, verbal chancletazos, which is just like, you know, verbal violence, shaming, mm -hmm. manipulation and that kind of thing. And so all of these things kind of fit into what I call chancla culture. Um, and the invitation is to shift that, you know, and the invitation is to look at those historical layers because indigenous cultures prior to colonization, for the most part, were very gentle, you know, some of the criticisms that I get are, this is a white people thing. Like you are, you know, you're rejecting Latinx culture. And I want to emphasize like, authoritarian parenting practices are actually a secondary cultural characteristic that were out of a response and a reaction to colonization and um, the oppression that we faced after, you know, having been colonized for, for the last 500 years. And so Black families, my Black friends and I talk about this all the time, like that has impacted their their families as well. Stacey Patton is an author who's done a lot of research on this when it comes to Black children um, and Black families. And, and, you know, there hasn't really been a lot of research done around the intergenerational effects of colonization on Latinx families. And that's kind of what I'm seeking to, to highlight. Um, because, yeah, I mean, like, you know, corn tortillas, corn, primary cultural characteristic. We have been using corn forever. Violence against children, relatively recent, <laughs> you know, relatively recent was a response to colonization. And so, um, so once I think we start looking at some of those historical aspects, it's easier for us to say, actually, this is not our culture. This is so not is, inherently a part of us. Is that when someone comes to you and says, I, you know, I'm, I made it through because of chancla culture and, and that was, that's what made me a, a good person. Is that what you point them to? Sometimes depending on depending how it's on presented. Who. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a whole workshop called ending chancla culture. And so it's all there. And, um, you know, I bring in the, uh, what I call the decolonized nonviolent parenting as kind of an antidote to chancla culture, because we are addressing those layers. We're addressing the cultural um, systemic and institutional factors that continue to impact Black and Brown families, um, Latinx families specifically in my work. And so, you know, there, there's a ton of information out there, but also not as much as there can be and not as much as there should be. Because, you know, as you know, like we were, there was an attempt at erasure. There was an attempt at, um, you know, really wanting Latinx families to assimilate, to acculturate. And so a lot has been lost in that process. Unfortunately, a lot of traditions have been lost. Um, a lot of practices have been lost, not all of them, but for us um, and definitely within the work of Latinx parenting, the intention is to reclaim that gentle parenting, not to feel like we're doing anything new. We're looking at it from the lens of 
our well ancestors, you know, our well ancestors practice these beautiful collaborative ways of living and being with children. Children were to be honored, you know, children were to be celebrated. Children were seen as spirits and as um, almost guides and, and teachers for us. Hmm. And so it's not new, you know, it's not a new thing that we just have to kind of like pull out of the air or like, you know, take from, from, um, from white folks. This is something that was inherent in us. Um, but because of historical trauma, things have shifted. Stay tuned for more Mindful Mama podcast right after this break. I don't know about you, but I am obsessed with not putting anything on my skin or on my baby's skin that I couldn't eat. Like, I don't want all those nasty chemicals on my skin. It's really important to me. That's why I'm so thrilled that Pipette is a new sponsor of the podcast. Pipette is a clean baby and mom care brand with a mission to give every family the best start. Any parent who wants what's best for their children, and that includes only using the safest products on their skin, Pipette has quickly become a customer favorite for its ultra gentle baby lotions, oils, and washes. And right now you can score 30% off its entire collection of personal care items. Pipette sets the standard of clean and best performing products. While the FDA bans only 12 potentially harmful ingredients in skincare products, uh, Pipette bans more than 2,000, ensuring its products are safe, effective, and only use non-toxic ingredients available. Pipette's products are also EWG verified, vegan, hypoallergenic, sustainable, pediatrician and dermatologist approved. All of Pipette's products are made with a key ingredient, squalane. When babies are born, their skin is coated with that creamy vernix, which provides that natural protection for newborns in their first few hours after birth. It's rich with ultra hydrating molecule squalane and has this nourishing waterproofing effect on baby's skin. That squalane is your baby's built-in moisturizer and is key to keeping skin safe. But after the protective vernix absorbs, your baby's skin needs a little extra love and care. That's where squalane comes in. Pipette is my dream brand for clean, non-toxic baby and mom care. You can go to pipettebaby.com and get 30% off now with the coupon code HUNTER. That's pipettebaby.com, P-I-P-E-T-T-E, baby.com, and get 30% off with the coupon code HUNTER. And if you check on right where you're listening to this podcast on your device, check in the show notes, scroll down, you'll find that link to pipettebaby.com right away. Check it out. They're awesome. 30% off with the coupon code HUNTER. I love that. I love that, you know, go back to say, like, actually, you know, what is real? You know, is it real that we have this, this questioning of like, is it real that we, this authoritarian is, some, is, is inherently part of this culture, right? And it's so interesting, you know, I, I read, um, and I love that, like, just going back to the roots, I, you know, and it's in kind of thinking about the whole thing is probably goes back to like, agriculture. I bet that's where, you know, the whole thing probably starts. But anyway, you know, it's interesting. I just kind of like on a side note, but just reclaiming kind of something and kind of looking at it more carefully and more um, seeing things more clearly is really interesting. I just read a, a New York Times uh, a piece about rednecks. So there was this guy who grew up like in coal mining country and people would kind of proudly talk about being a redneck there. And and then he, but he was gay. He went away. He felt like he, this culture didn't accept him, et cetera. He became a more like, you know, just, you know, anti-racist kind of person. And he discovered <clears throat> that the term redneck actually goes back to um, when the coal miners were striking and working to get better working conditions for all coal miners, including immigrant coal miners and including black American coal miners, they wore a red bandana around their necks to signify that they were part of the rednecks who were fight who were unionizing and fighting the big coal companies that wanted to give them terrible conditions. And they were fighting for better conditions for everyone. Actually, they weren't just fighting for better conditions for the white guys. And 
it's really fascinating to see like, oh, this is actually the opposite of you know, what we think it is, right? Like, you know, but, but the, be, you know, the people in power write the story and, you know, in, in yeah. those, some of those areas, the they don't teach that history of, because of the, you know, big coal influence or something, right? So it's interesting. It's like, there's so much richness in the history, you know, there's so much information there. And I feel like, unfortunately, that is not as amplified, you know, that's not what is being um, taught, like you said, and there are there are systems in place, there's patriarchy that does not want women's empowerment, you know, there's um, capitalism that wants us to feel like we're all each other's enemies. And so we have to understand that we are kind of like swimming in all of these um, institutions that have been around for a really long time, racism, you know, there's a lot of um, conversations happening in the Latinx community right now about our role in the Black liberation movement. And so people have come to Latinx parenting and to other uh, friends of mine and said, you know, what about, what about Latinx rights? Like, what about, um, you know, people have said, like, what about Latinx lives matter? Um, and so I really have to kind of take a breath, first of all, <laughs> because I know the history of the case system. Like I know the history of um, what happened in Latin America after you know the the slave trade was that it was in the benefit of the indigenous people to align ourselves with whiteness. Um, and so it was out of survival. You know, it was out of survival that we have this colorism in our home still. I'm lighter skinned than my sister even. And so, and, and then a lot of my cousins. And so my mom would always comment on like, oh my gosh, you're so fair. You're so beautiful. Your hair is light brown. Not like me, cause she looks very much indigenous. Um, and so that does something, you know, that says something to children about, about their worth, depending on the color of their skin, depending on whether they were born a girl or a boy. Um, there are all of these things that we're constantly kind of trying to navigate um, just around like who we are as a people, you know, and our identity and our history. And so I think it's really empowering for us to, to take it upon ourselves to learn some of that history so that we can see what is real, like you said, what is actually true. Um, yeah, rather than blaming, like it doesn't make yeah. a lot of sense to blame our parents. Like they were in this, you know, they didn't know any better, right? Like that was good parenting was to give your kid a SWAT, right? Like that's yeah. the idea, uh, uh, you know, and, and all of those things, right? Like to raise your your girls to value, you know, all the different things like, you know, and et cetera. It's like, it's no, there's no, no point in blaming, but understanding. Yes. Yeah. Like, let's understand it. Let's look at it. Let's, yeah. let's ha build that awareness. And let's make a conscious choice, you know, yeah. a conscious choice about how we move forward now, now that I understand, right. Like now that I understand that it's, it's in this like perpetual um, colonization of like the next people to keep children um especially without a voice you know without the ability to stand up for themselves um without the validation that i think would empower them if they felt like their rights were taken away like i really believe that oppression does begin in the home right mm -hmm. and so are we operating through a lens of oppression when we are parenting our children or do we want to parent through a lens of liberation and say, actually, I'm going to normalize what it feels like to feel free and what it feels like to be empowered to use your voice. Because when you go out into the world, you're gonna to be told to shut up by the world. And I want you to know what feels good. And when that doesn't feel good, I want you to be able to use your voice because you've practiced it with me. I can imagine like your family's like, you're encouraging them to talk back. Like this yeah. is like, oh my goodness, what the heck is Leslie doing? <laughs> lots of discomfort, lots of discomfort in the family. Um, but I feel like this is just, you know, this is just a part, like this is just a part of what needs to happen. It's really beautiful because one of my um, cousins reached out to me recently and she was a teen mom. Um, she now has two children. She's in her early twenties and um, she started taking my courses. I was like, just take whatever you want. Like, just, you know, <laughs> tell me which one looks good for you. Um, and I'll register you and you can just have it. And she's just, she just started eating it up. And so that was completely surprising to me because um, her mom was pretty abusive. Her mom was also a teen mom. Her dad passed away when, he, when she was, I think like one or two. And so she's beginning this work, you know, and, and, um, and I wouldn't think that 
some of my cousins like really would be interested in this. I think that I haven't had that like public conversation with them of like, this is the work that I'm doing, <laughs> you know? Um, but I have with some of them and they all know because I was on like Telemundo and Univision and they like watched me speak in Spanish about chancla culture. Um, I don't know how they feel about it. I haven't really asked them, like, how do you feel about the work that I'm doing? Um, because it's really not, it's not for me to change anything about it you know, if I were to hear those criticisms or those judgments. Um, but there is hope, you know, there is hope in my cousin and there is hope in some of the other uh, relatives I have or friends even that are beginning that journey of self-reflection to think about what is my intention here? You know, yeah, what do I want to keep? What do I want to let go of? You're speaking to the people who are ready to to listen. So, so what did you, how did you start to, how, what did you, I mean, so when, before you got pregnant, were you like, I'm doing things differently. And no, no, <laughs> well, no cause, not. cause that was, I, I was like, yeah, I'm using some timeouts. I'm using me some timeouts when my daughter was little, yeah. I was like, Oh my God. Like, I'm not going to have an undisciplined child. That was the way I thought about it. <laughs> I thought about it that same way. I thought about it that same way. And I remember this, this situation where there was a toddler, she must've been like two, maybe two and a half. And she, we were at Sioux Plantation and she was walking by my husband and I, and I was pregnant at, the, pregnant at the time. And she just threw herself on the ground and started having like the most massive tantrum. And her father walked up to her and got down on her level and rubbed her back. And I was like, what the hell is this? <laughs> I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> You know, like, oh my gosh, like, this is inappropriate. You're coddling your child here, you know? And I didn't say anything, but I just, I waited and she, she ended up like, he ended up picking her up and she was still like crying. So he took her outside, um, but in a really gentle and really loving way. Mm. And this was, you know, almost 10 years ago. Um, I was, I was working as a preschool teacher at the time. So I knew the value of connection for my preschoolers, you know, but I still believed in spanking. Like I still believed in that harsh discipline. And so my partner and I at the time, we're, we were talking about, he's still my partner, um, but we were talking about what we would do in that situation because it was in front of us, you know, and I was, I think maybe eight months pregnant. And he was like, well, you know, I would have just spanked her. And I was like, I totally would have spanked her too. Like, this is inappropriate. You're at a restaurant, you know? And so it was amazing because I had had that education, that formal education of child development. I had had that formal education of, um, you know, whatever I had to do to become a preschool teacher. And yet I still had this internalized idea of children not being worthy of the same level of respect as anybody else you know, this very internalized childism. Um, and it wasn't until I really think like the moment that my daughter was born and I looked at her and I really felt like this is me, you know, this is me. How can this child deserve anything less than respect and love and honoring? Mm. And I immediately felt this sense of like, this is the way I need to be talking to myself actually. Like, how do I reject myself? continuously? How do I not honor and love and feel my essence? Mm. You know, and it really started me on this kind of path of additional intentionality because I felt very intentional with the way that I birthed. I gave birth at home. Um, I was already moving towards gentleness, but I do remember that situation at that restaurant where I was triggered, mm -hmm. you know, and that was my first moment of like, even though I believe in connection, even though I believe in attachment, even though I believe in gentleness, here I am feeling like, oh my gosh, if this happened to me, I would probably spank her. But maybe it wasn't even out of a want to spank. It was out of just like, that's probably what would happen because I would be so triggered. Stay tuned for more Mindful Mama podcast right after this break. Sleep is so incredibly important for us. I mean, I teach meditation, and before we even get to any meditation for calming our reactivity, we need to have enough sleep, or we are not giving ourselves the resources we need to parent well. I hear from my clients about sleep issues, trying lavender and soothing things, but you know what? For me, one of the things that has worked for me incredibly is new calm. 
I used New Calm to when I was all riled up and I needed to calm down and I put on the headphones and I put on the sticker and I listened and all I had to do was lie there comfortably and listen and I went from all riled up to the calmest, most peaceful, my whole body from head to toe, 100% just like light and calm and feeling amazing. It feels so good. I've been talking about it to all my friends. So Nucom is the only system of its kind. It's clinically proven in over 1 million sessions to improve your sleep, reduce your stress, and boost your recovery without drugs and side effects. The Nucom system uses cutting edge neuroscience and consists of these three non-invasive, non-pharmaceutical items, all of which are included in your monthly subscription that costs less than a cup of coffee. And the whole process is super easy to use and easy to work into your daily routine to achieve better sleep, reduction in stress, and boost in recovery. Do what I did own the day with new calm and make 2021 the year you improve your sleep because it is so so important we have a special link set up specifically for our listeners so go to hunternewcalm.com to get 50 percent off your 30-day subscription of new calm and their money back guarantee that's hunter new calm and com. hunter N-U-C-A-L-M dot com. And if you're listening to this podcast on your device, you can just click on the show notes tab on your device and you'll see that link right there. That's hunternewcom.com. Get 50% off. It's amazing. It really is extraordinary. Check it out. Yeah, and it's I, like that's the habit. That's the that's that's the way your neuron your neurons have fired in the past, and so yeah. it's just like doing that thing that it does again. You know, just repeating patterns. Yeah, so absolutely. It is. It is really crazy. <laughs> it's like, well, it's so interesting because we think like we think we can just decide, right? We think we can just be like, okay, Leslie and Hunter are right. I'm going to be a peaceful parent. I'm not going to hit my kid. I'm going to learn these skillful communication stuff. Um, Maybe I'm going to meditate, you know, whatever. Like we think we just, we think we're just going to, or we think we're just going to decide and then do the thing that we decided to do, Mm -hmm. you know? And that's not how the human biology works. Like we just, we end up like repeating these, these old patterns unless we practice, you know, we make an intentional effort to practice and learn and do something, get support, right? Like do the things, do something different. Like it, it's not just, we can't just be like, okay, that's what I'm going to do. Boom. You know, and, and we don't just change like that. No, no, we're not robots in that way. Yes. You know, we're, we're really um, multidimensional people and, and, and humans, you know, I was talking to a, a coaching client of mine and she was like, my kids get very loud. You know, they just get very loud and it's very stimulating and it's very difficult for me to stay regulated in those moments. And, you know, I, I can't tell you that whenever there's loud noise that you're going to stay regulated, you know, and we kind of like unpacked it some more, but it's a natural response. It's a natural response when your child says, I hate you to feel defensive about it. You know, it's a natural response when you get the door slammed on you that you get a response and you have a response. Um, it's really that reconnection to our bodies though, you know, that reconnection to the mindfulness, right? This is why you're like mindful mama <laughs> mentor, because the mindfulness is what supports us in, in being observational about what's happening, right? And acknowledging that somatic response of like, oh, my belly is feeling really tight and hot right now. What do I need to do to move energy and breath into that space so that I can operate from a place in my brain that is more aligned with my intentions? Obviously, you and I know this, it's not always going to work. <laughs> you know, like I'm going to probably open that door and be like, you don't shut, you know, you don't shut the door on my face. I totally uh, that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. Very familiar. I would think to a lot of people. Um, but that's where the repair comes in, you know, and I really feel like the, the repair is just an opportunity for us to deepen that connection with our children and to show them I am human too. I have the same kind of brain that you do. You know, I have that, I have tantrums <laughs> mm-hmm. also. Um, 
And so it's, it's a really, you know, it's been a really beautiful experience for me to watch my daughter sometimes embody that mindfulness before I do and say like, mama, my chest is feeling really tight right now. Like I just need to go to my room and have some space because she has her two siblings now who are actively, you know, activating her nervous system by like going into her things. And, um, and so we have these ongoing conversations around what, what can we do? What can we do after we blow up on our siblings? You know, what can we do after we, um, and it was really cute. Um, she created a list for me of things that I can do Aww. when I am activated. And she Aww. put it over my bedroom door. She was like, okay, mom, when you are stressed out and when you feel like you're going to yell, here are some of the things that you can do. And she made this list for me. <laughs> and I was like, thank you. Because some of them were really helpful. It was like, count to 10, take a deep breath. And this is stuff that we have been talking about since she was really little, you know? And so I'm seeing that she knows, like she knows what, um, what can happen and also knows that it's not always going to be so black and white and so linear, but mm. it's been really cool. That's amazing. And so, you know, I, I love all of this. I, you know, you, you talked about how, you know, you had, you have, you had some transformation to do in yourself, you know, like you had to remother yourself. Um, how, and you were becoming like aware of that voice in your head. So you were, and you also were saying that like in the culture you grew up in, like it's interesting because we've talked about respect in a couple different ways here. You know, we've talked about respect. You were talking about it in the, in the culture you grew up in as like respect meant obedience. And we were talking, I was doing the, I, I've been doing the mindful parenting teacher training. We were talking about respect the other day too. And it's like, respect is an interesting word because you, you know, it can mean like, and certain kind, like when I think of respect, I think of like, I'm if I'm respecting you, I am considering your feelings and your needs and whatever. I'm basically like considerate, right? Yeah. Like that's kind of my definition of respect. But then there's a definition of respect where you know, like I don't know, if like you're a street gang, you respect another street gang, like you're kind of afraid of them, so you're not yeah. going to touch them, right? Like there's that fear element too. And so you were talking about respect kind of being in your culture, like equivalent to obedience, but then kind of thinking about respect for children as more equivalent to consideration of their needs and feelings. So how did you start to, I guess what I'm saying is like, uh, what I'm asking, <laughs> I'm not asking a question there, but like <laughs> what I'm asking is like, what I want to know is like, how did you start to re-mother yourself? What did you, where did you start? You know, cause we, we can start with we start with the body, we start with the mind, you know, we start to look at our needs. What were some of the, what were some of the like kind of beliefs that you had to unpack that you didn't even realize that you had there? Like there was the one, right? Like that child needs a spanking, right? Like yeah. what else did you discover and have to unpack? Yeah, I think there were, there were quite a few things. And I really want to give a shout out to one of my mentors. Her name is Sylvia Poero, who was trained under a woman named Margaret Paul, who practices inner bonding. Um, from the time I was, my daughter was about one, I started seeing Sylvia and, and doing this inner child work and really recognizing the fact that I still held a lot of emotion and a lot of somatic experience even about what has happened to me, what had happened to me as a child. I'm just going to um, pause you right here because I want to just define somatic experience for the yes. listener who may not know. So yeah. would you... <laughs> it's, it's sensation you know it's a sensation in your body it's acknowledging where it is you are feeling any tension um you know where it, and then when you move into kind of like transforming it where can you relax where can you release that tension um so it's not as like we're it's not as like academic <laughs> you know like I think all of us have access to this um so body sensations you know when I felt tight, um, when I felt contraction in my body and I didn't know where that came from, I think the process of remothering myself and really introducing this concept into my life allowed me to not judge those experiences, you know, not become angry with myself for having had a negative response or a negative reaction to something. And so it began with this release of judgment about 
my experience, you know, I felt like when I was experiencing triggers, um, and I want to be really mindful about this word too, because it was brought up to me not that long ago that the word triggers can actually bring up some negative emotions for people that are victims of gun violence. Um, And so now I tend to call them activations more often than not. Hmm. And so when I feel these activations, um, there's something deeper, you know, there's something deeper and reconnecting with the child that is within me, that's afraid um, either of being hurt or being abandoned or, you know, is not receiving that respect, right? As a child, I did not receive a lot of respect. And so whenever I feel disrespected, air quotes around disrespected, um, I may become very activated, right? Because it is that inner child woundedness that is responding. And so really envisioning my inner child, either by having like a a framed photograph of myself as a child, um, by connecting with like my old doll, which sounds very weird for people, but like it really does help to have this like visual concrete idea of our inner child. Um, So I think, you know, that's been really powerful for me. And then acknowledging that I can be my own mother, like I have access to my inner mother. And this is like the work of Bethany Webster and then also um, inner bonding. But the inner mothering and becoming my own mother and actively speaking with my inner child and saying, I got you, you know, you are safe. Um, What is it that you need right now? Like, let's tend to your needs and not in a way that I'm going to be really permissive about my inner child's needs, right? Like if my inner child is saying, I really want to shout at my husband right now, (laughs) like I really want to shout at him and like, you know, hurt him. I want to like whack him with the spatula. Um, that's not necessarily like the true need underneath, right? And so sometimes because we don't have the alternative, um, what I have learned is that our inner mother also needs support and that support comes from guidance. You know, that support comes from a connection to something bigger than ourselves. Some people could call it spirit or source. Um, I call it my future grandmother self, my future abuelita self. And so bringing in this idea of how how do I move through this in a way that is in alignment with the way that I ultimately want to be, you know, and how do I ultimately want to show up? And this is why I love the the idea of your future grandmother self or your future abuelita self, because if we become open to that, I really feel like we can receive um, that guidance. And that may seem kind of woo-woo for some of your listeners, like, um, but, but I, that's I, like a voice inside you, just like your yes. inner child is a voice inside you, right? That that yes. sort of future wise version of you is also a version that's inside of you. Absolutely. And I fully believe that, you know, we have access to it. You know, I have I have access to my inner mother. I have access to my future abuelita self. I have access to my inner niña, my inner child, um, who I call my inner niña. But I also have access to all of the beautiful things that the earth provides. You know, I have access to mother earth. That's another mother of mine. You know, what are the elements that I can bring into my life that really help me feel grounded and help me remember what is truly valuable? You know, is it valuable that, you know, my child be sitting and distance learning for a ridiculous amount of time? Or, you know, is it more valuable to kind of go out and and do some grounding um, by our tree in the backyard? You know, like, let's, let's figure out how we can bring in the resources of the earth, um, who have supported us forever, you know, and who actually reconnect us to our ancestors too, because that's, that's what they were in tune with. Um, And so it is, again, like, it goes back to that reclaiming, you know, this is not anything new. I don't think that thinking about ourselves as children, um, who have these beautiful, innocent spirits and essences, like that's nothing new. Um, And so I think the framework of the inner mothering and the inner child work and the remothering work from the time my daughter was really young has been totally transformative for me, you know, and it, and it actually frees my own mom and it frees my partner and it frees everybody else who I am not responsible for, you know, I'm not responsible for my mother's inner child. I'm not responsible for my partner's inner child. I'm only responsible for mine. So what are the things that I can do to make sure that I'm 
you know, responsive to my own inner child. And in doing that, it allows me to be responsive to my outer children. Amen. Yeah. I mean, I kind of think of that, like when, you know, that's like the heart of interconnection, right? Like in in a way, like, you know, that we talked about in the beginning that like in that we inter are and we interconnected that, that place of saying, I'm going to take responsibility for me, I think is at the heart of that interconnection. Like, I, you know, I think that's, that's really beautiful. And I also want to share with you that that's also at the heart of mindfulness was it's not like this thing you're doing by yourself. Like that's what the Buddha did right before he became enlightened was he, he was assailed by doubt and he touched the earth and he called on the support of the earth, you know, and I'm not doing it alone. I'm doing it with the earth, right? Like, yeah, I love that. So, yeah. So, okay. So that's incredibly beautiful. I love that for the listeners like, okay, yeah, but what do you do every day? Like what's some concrete stuff that you do? Like, how do you keep yourself in this grounded, like connected to your, your inner grandmother place? Like what are some co- more concrete play- pieces of that? On good days, um, <laughs> <laughs> on days when I'm rested, um, I yeah, think you have no, a one-year-old. Let's remember <laughs> you're not, may not be getting a lot of sleep. A three-year-old <laughs> and the nine-year-old. Um, and a 34-year-old uh partner who, you know, I'm not gonna go there. But um, <laughs> you know, I think when when my practice is strong, it means that in the mornings I check in with my body first and foremost. So where is it that I'm holding any tension? Um, Where is it that may need a little stretch? You know, I don't usually have time to like do a full yoga session in the morning because my kids are needing me. But if I just sit up and I roll my neck, Mm -hmm. you know, if I sit up and I just kind of relax my shoulders and I'm breathing into this space, something that's been really powerful, Hunter, um, and I'm sure that, you know, people are like, oh yeah, duh, but this gratitude practice, you know, what a miracle it is that I woke up today. What a miracle it is that I get to see the sunshine today. You know, for those of us in Southern California, I know this is <laughs> this is a privilege. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, you know, I do feel like there's so there's so much miraculousness to just being in this embodiment at this time. Um, and so I do, you know, I, I open the door every morning and I feel the sunshine on my face. Um, when there is sunshine available, there wasn't today, it was actually raining. But even the rain, you know, the rain is cleansing. And so there's, there's things to be grateful for, I think in, in most moments. Um, so that's one. And then I actually do have, and this is something that I, I help others kind of create in the reparenting course that I do. Um, but I have an altar to my inner niña and I have an altar to my inner mother and to my future abuelita self. And I have images of my grandmother, you know, and I have images of mothers um, nursing and I have images of myself as a child. And so, um, you know, often I will go to that space and I'll just light some incense around it and I'll like light a candle and just, this is the intentionality, right? Like this is my intention is to approach this day as ceremony. Um, My kids are very interested in my altar and so it doesn't stay super organized all the time, but, but I also want to model that intentionality. And so in practice, you know, if something happens in the morning, um, if I'm feeling rushed, if I didn't get a lot of sleep that night, sometimes it doesn't activate. Like I don't have the practice a hundred percent down all the time, but it's also a very self-reflective process. So when I didn't get enough sleep and I snapped at my kid, like my inner child is still there asking for that to be, to be um, addressed, you know, like what happened there? And so, um, definitely like the gratitude practice, the grounding, the coming back into our bodies, and then that reflection and that repair after it doesn't go our way, you know, after that intentionality, after that mindfulness, after that grounding, and then I still snap, like I'm still not going to judge myself. Good. Good. Yeah. Releasing judgment is such a huge step. It's such a huge, powerful, beautiful step into like growing and changing. It's, it's incredible. I think Leslie, this has to be like part one. 
conversation, <laughs> conversation part one, because there's so many things we didn't talk about. Like I, and I know you have a, 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 a strong time limit. And, um, and so there's, this is like, we're just kind of like, we're, what do they say? Like you're putting a pin in it. We're going to keep this conversation going at another time. I, I can't thank you enough. Where can people find out more about what you're doing in Latinx parenting? Yeah, they can go to latinxparenting.org. We are getting our website redone. So um, it's under construction a little bit, but our events are there. Uh, most information about who we are and what we do is there. And then I'm very active on Instagram. So if you go to at Latinx Parenting or uh, Facebook, just search Latinx Parenting, it'll come up. Um, so I'm constantly posting on there, repurposing old posts because they're they're valuable. You know, I, I feel very fortunate that um, I have the space and that this community has been receptive to um, some of these concepts and ideas. And I just love having those conversations there. So that's where people can find us. And I am also writing a book, um, which will hopefully be out by the end of next year in 2022. And so I um, oh, hope that people will, will follow and then maybe gain interest in that down the line. Yay. That's so cool. And yeah, sometimes you see some of Leslie's things reposted on mindful mom Instagram page because yeah. they're so good. Yeah. Um, Leslie, this has been such a joy and a pleasure. I really appreciate your voice and the presence you bring to this work and this, you know, just opening this conversation in such a beautiful, um, authentic way. It's really gorgeous. So um, thank you so very much for coming on the mindful mama podcast. Thank you, Hunter. I appreciate you. I love Leslie's whole approach and I mean it when I say I want her to come back again. So if you want me to bring Leslie back to the podcast again, make sure you tag me and let me know. You can let me know on Instagram. I'm at Mindful Mama Mentor. If you've enjoyed this episode, this is a great one to share out into the world, right? We need these to share these voices, right? So please take a screenshot, share it with your friends, share it on, you know, wherever you want to share it. I like to text these things to my mom group friends. So maybe you'll be doing the same. And that's a great way to just spread the word, just person by person. That's how this tribe has grown so big and strong. Woot, woot. We are a strong tribe of mamas and papas. So yay. I love, I loved talking to Leslie. Definitely want to have her back. And I'm so glad and so grateful to be connecting with you. I really appreciate your time that you have shared with me and Leslie today. It's really an honor and I'm wishing you a peaceful week. I'm wishing you more peace and ease in every part of your life and especially with your kiddos. Yeah. Good luck in the crazy pandemic world. And we'll just take it one moment at a time. And remember, we can begin anew in any moment. We can begin anew right now from right here. Thank you so much for joining me. Namaste. I say definitely do it. It's really helpful. It will change your relationship with your kids for the better. It will help you communicate better. And just, I'd say communicate better as a person, as a wife, as a spouse. It's been really a positive influence in our lives. So definitely do it. I'd say definitely do it. It's so worth it. The money really is inconsequential when you get so much benefit from being a better parent to your children and feeling like you're connecting more with them and not feeling like you're yelling all the time or you're like, why isn't things working? I would say definitely do it. It's so, so worth it. It'll change you. No matter what age someone's child is, it's a great opportunity for personal growth and it's a great investment in someone's family. I'm very thankful I have this. You can continue in your old habits that aren't working or you can learn some new tools and gain some perspective to shift everything in your parenting. Are you frustrated by parenting? Do you listen to the experts and try all the tips and strategies, but you're just not seeing the results that you want? Or are you lost as to where to start? Does it all seem so overwhelming with too much to learn? Are you yearning for a community of people who get it, who also don't want to threaten and punish to create cooperation? Hi, I'm Hunter Clark Fields, and if you answered yes to any of these questions, I want you to seriously consider the Mindful Parenting membership. You will be joining hundreds of members who have discovered the path of mindful parenting and now have confidence and clarity in their parenting. 
this isn't just another parenting class. This is an opportunity to really discover your unique, lasting relationship, not only with your children, but with yourself. It will translate into lasting, connected relationships, not only with your children, but your partner too. Let me change your life. Go to mindfulparentingcourse.com to add your name to the wait list so you will be the first to be notified when I open the membership for enrollment. I look forward to seeing you on the inside. mindfulparentingcourse.com